Good afternoon everyone. My name is Niels van der Ven, Education Manager at the Center for Innovation and your host for today at this talk show MOOCs at Leiden University in honor of the relaunch of the completely revamped course Terrorism and Counterterrorism, Comparing Theory and Practice. This is a co-creation between the Center for Innovation and the Institute of Security and Global Affairs. Why is the terrorism course still relevant in today's society? And what can curious learners um, learn? What are MOOCs and do they still have value? What can Leiden University learn from MOOCs for their stated goal of becoming a blended university? Is this an impossible moonshot? What do teachers and faculties need from the board of directors to make it possible? And how do MOOCs contribute to Leiden University's strategies on diversity and social impact? With me today at our table uh, are my esteemed guests, which I will introduce to you. First of all, um, Hester Bell, Rector Magnificus um, at Leiden University. Um, Kun Caminada, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. Sorry, welcome Hester and welcome Koen, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Edwin Bakken and Jardine de Roy uh, Zuiderwijn, which are both um, well, the creators of this MOOC. Um, my, my auto cue stopped running. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Ah, it's starting. We will be, dis be discussing massive open online courses, MOOCs, today. A phenomenon that has been with Leiden University since 2013 and how that links to the strategy of Leiden University. You can join our debate by adding your comments to our live stream. Our moderators will bring any interesting questions to my attention. Yes, we start with some discussion questions. Um, Hester. Leiden University has created over 35 MOOCs in the last nine years, co-created with the Center for Innovation, with over one and a half million learnings, learners enrolled so far. That's quite a number, with a campus of over 30,000 students in Leiden and The Hague. What do you think that MOOCs have brought to the campus education of Leiden University in the last decade? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, we've been exploring new digital technologies uh, since 2013, as you said and been experimenting with different virtual and blended concepts like MOOCs and blended learning. And this allowed us uh, to take a fresh look at our didactical framework and really learn what works and what doesn't work. Because for us it's crucial to have good education, excellent education, that is what we go for. Uh, well, if you look at MOOCs, what it brought to us, MOOCs are an ideal way and our, our, our ideal means to reach many, many people all around the world, so locally as well as globally. I heard there are now uh, people uh, tuning in from all over the world. I think that's much harder uh, to do uh, physically than they have to travel lots. So I think that's an element. So our knowledge, uh, our, our top education can reach people all over the world. Also pe people who have maybe trouble uh, traveling or don't have the funds uh, to, to, uh, to be part of our educational programs. And it is also for them a way to try out uh, our educational programs and see whether it is something for them. And maybe then later join us in, uh, in blended learnings or, or really here on campus. Uh, I think uh, it, it also prepared us for something that hit uh, the whole world, uh, actually, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and, and in that way, we were at least slightly virtual uh, equipped. Uh, our teachers had some experience uh, with the technical uh, uh, um, uh, infrastructure. We had the technical infrastructure there. Uh, we learned about it, what works and what doesn't work. So it helped us, of course, we still had to have a huge, uh, huge change, a huge project on remote teaching. But I think the basis for that was uh, laid in 2013. And then uh, maybe finally, so having the right support is crucial for this. So, so you have, of course, MOOCs and MOOCs. And I think it's crucial to have professional MOOCs uh, high standard MOOCs, so the right technical infrastructure, the right knowledge uh, about the didactics and the, uh, and the right uh, expertise with our teachers. Thank you, and thankfully we have that in-house. Yes. Um, there are some changes in the work at our university, as was hinted in the new strategy that you presented at the RDS on the 8th of February. 
How do you feel MOOCs are currently uh, contributing to the strategy of uh, Leiden University? Yes, we recently uh, uh, presented our new strategic plan that we made with our whole university community and also with external stakeholders. We spent a year interacting with lots of people to define a new strategy and it's called innovating and connecting. So innovative and in connection. Well, I think MOOCs are <laughs> innovative and connecting us to the whole world. So I think they're spot on uh, for our new strategic uh, plan. Also elements in that plan, if you read our digitalization, uh, where blended learning plays, of course, a role, but also having an impact on the world. So topics like sustainability, diversity and inclusion and internationalization. So I think also having MOOCs on topics uh, that are uh, uh, and those elements, we can have a larger impact uh, on the world. So for example, uh, courses that have a global social impact, uh, we're right now developing one, well, we're you, uh, you have the opportunity to listen to one, of course, on uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. But we're also developing one on uh, sustainability with a focus on local solutions uh, uh, to global challenges uh, being produced by Thijs Bokers and Paul Beers of Leiden University mm -hmm. College. And they show that uh, uh, actually we take our role seriously, not only for the knowledge, but also having impact uh, on the world. So I think in that way, uh, MOOCs uh, are also an important element for our new strategy. Thank you very much. Um, we're talking now about MOOCs and but also blended learning. Um, how will blended learning be supported at Leiden University, let's say, in the coming five years? What will be the next steps? Ah, that's a good question. We're still <laughs> learning every day, I can say. <laughs> so, so, so I don't know what we will be doing in five or six years. But we're, what we're doing right now, we said, it, it's the most important thing is excellent education. So then either digital or on campus, we learned also the last past years that on campus has its crucial elements, really the interaction being physically together, not only for the knowledge exchange and for, for the competences that uh, our students develop, but also for well-being, uh, it is important. So I think it will always be a blend. And what blend exactly, we're discussing right now and finding out. Um, that's one element. Uh, the second element is that we will support it uh, and that we need to support it even better, close to our teachers. So we're making right now a, a better network of all the expertise we have on, uh, on the um, innovations, on the infrastructure, the technical parts, as well as didactics, so really integrated, integrate that knowledge within our university centrally, but also inside the faculties towards the teachers. And through that supporting network with our teachers, we will then develop step by step our educational pa uh, program in five and six years, and we'll see then what kind of blend we will have. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Hester. Um, I would like to continue with the, the Vice Dean of this faculty, the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs, Koen. Uh, your faculty has created um, several MOOCs in the last nine years, uh, besides this one, the Terrorism MOOC. Um, there's a MOOC on Security Studies, EU Policy, and for instance one on Risk uh, that's created uh, together with the LDE partners, um, TU Delft and the Erasmus University. How has that benefited this faculty, your faculty, do you think? That that's a difficult question to answer because uh, over time we developed indeed several of those MOOCs at several stages also on, on the technique, on different stages of educational levels. But, but, but I think the main thing is that we learn something ourselves, how to use this kind of online uh, education in your own program. So uh, as was already stating that it, it's always a mix of kind of forms you use as, uh, uh, as a teacher or as a program and you would like to optimize both what you can have as, as instruments, uh, lecturing, uh, MOOCs, uh, spokes, and all those things, uh, with, of course, the group uh, you are teaching. And I think that's the main issue that MOOCs learns on, especially not only the techniques, but what kind of place this can have in your overall program. I think that, that that's one of those things. And, of course, another beneficial thing, of course, is uh, yeah, that we have a large of outreach uh, outside our lecture room. Usually, uh, uh, traditionally, we only reached out to our students, maybe some, some other people, that, that was what it is. And now uh, the whole world is just looking and listening to all kind of subjects we are teaching. So that's also, of course, very beneficial. And, and, and finally, uh, also economically, uh, 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 when you have such a MOOC, 
you can use it and you can reuse it for another year and especially when it is a rather theoretical part or, or something which, which can go on for, for a couple of years you can use it both in your lecture rooms uh, for outreach and reuse it so it's also economically uh, beneficial uh, for us to use this kind of, of mugs. Yeah. Thank you Kun. Um, Esther already referred to it, we, over we came from a pandemic, which is even still going on, yes. uh, you can say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, you were the part of the central crisis team of the university, and um, yeah, you made some decisions together with this team during the COVID crisis. Um, the pandemic forced most, yeah, all teachers, for emergency remote teaching, um, with not enough time to redesign their education, their courses, at their own pace. But they have also, they also grown more experienced um, at using online teaching formats, of course, in the last two years. Um, did the pandemic change your perspective on online and blended learning? Of course, of course. I think everybody. Uh, we were not in, I would say, a very front-running position at Leiden University to have all kind of online education. And now, of course, we were forced to. Everybody was forced to. But because we were maybe a little bit lacking behind, we, we can really, uh, and we did, uh, we uh, uh, achieved an incredible uh, 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 increase in it. And how did we do it? Actually, we trust mainly on our lecturers. Uh, they didn't have that much research, especially at the beginning. We tried to, to bring some. Uh, and then you always have front runners. So we gave trust, especially in the front runners. Just, just let them go. And they did a marvelous job. And of course, we tried to. Uh, 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 to accommodate and to help those people who really need the help for a basic level of, of online education. But we also focused on those front runners. And, and, and we are a rather young faculty. Uh, um, uh, so, so it really changed, of course, by definition, the pandemic, uh, uh, how we have to teach. But uh, I think it was also a very yeah, uh, uh, stimulating uh, uh, period uh, because those people who were ahead and uh, were stimulating, and especially our educational directors, who really give the opportunities to also to make mistakes. That's also very important, to yes. uh, have some mm. mistakes to Definitely. learn uh, from it. Uh, it really changed the way we were thinking about education, and as I was already stating that, we also learned, and actually we didn't think about that before the pandemic, but we also learned when in on-campus education uh, uh, is important. Because that was, I think, the main message from the pandemic, when do you need to have in-person classes and when can you really use all kind of online, online teaching? I think that, that made, uh, uh, the pandemic made that very clear to us. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, and I think that blended form of education is, is something that we should keep. Um, do you think that fully blended version of education is the way forward for this faculty, uh, no. Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs? <laughs> no, I'm very, very, very uh, You said fully blended. I think the life will be blended for everybody, also uh, within the universities. But fully blended is, is, uh, uh, would not recognize that people need a mix of, of, of educational forms. So we know that, that some forms, it's pretty hard or even not even possible to do that uh, in an online situation, like in-depth debates, uh, convincing each other, and all kinds of things. Maybe you can do something online, but it works better just in class or on campus. Other parts of our program will be, be fully online because it's helpful. So I think we really should think and rethink uh, uh, the mix we have in our educational programs. And I think that's helpful. And of course, this will be more online and more spots and more MOOCs and more uh, uh, Learn Anyway uh, uh, rooms we have uh, at our faculty compared to uh, 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 the past. So it will, be, it will be increasing, but fully blended, I don't think so. Okay, uh, thank you, Kuhn. Um, no. One more question. As a faculty, and also you teach yourself, what do you, f what do you need uh, in the coming years to, to yeah, implement what you just spoke Okay, about? well, we just focus for, for the moment on blended learning. What we really need is technical support. So, so in this faculty, we have incorporated three lecture rooms, which are uh, with high-tech uh, high infrastructure, especially uh, uh, for... for, for, for uh, 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 not only uh, uh, the video, but also uh, uh, that the that, that, that classroom is, uh, uh, is organized in a way that in case there's a student just backwards and he's saying something that people at home can, can just uh, hear what they say. So especially noise is, is very important. 
And of course the skills teachers have, because teaching in a blended situation is totally different uh, uh, in case you really would like to uh, uh, stimulate people who are not in, 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 uh, on campus but they are somewhere else. To really incorporate that in your courses, the training is very important. So what we are, uh, uh, we are devoting now time for our lecturers to, to get them trained in, in, uh, in the blended situation. We devoted uh, money or we, 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 we reallocated the budget to have this lectures room. And I think that, that should continue for a couple of years. We have now three of those lecture rooms over here. They are overbooked already. So we need some, uh, no, we need some additional space. But I think it will not grow endlessly. I think we really need something like 10 of them and then, then we have a nice mix. So it's facilities and it's time of training. I think that are the two main issues. Uh, yes. Thank solve. you very much, yeah. Kun. Uh, Shadi. Together with your colleague Edwin, uh, you have been using the MOOC, Terrorism and Counterterrorism, uh, Comparing Theory and Practice, uh, also in a flipped concept, um, flip the classroom or blended learning in the Master Crisis and Security Management of the Institute of ISCHA. How does that work? And do yeah. study students then simply follow the course online or is there something more involved? Yeah, thanks. And I think it's really linked to what our vice dean also just said, like really thinking about this mix of on and offline, right? So we really spend a lot of time in the beginning to see how can we use these videos in the best way possible. And I think we can really work well as a replacement of the traditional large scale lecture where students are more passive kind of listeners um, to replace the kind of whole colleges, but not as you said for like discussion, um, serious game where people really apply it. So we spend a lot of time thinking, okay, how can we use these videos for the more traditional lectures? And then we can use our precious in-class time. We don't have so much of it, so you really want to use it as best as we can. How can we use that to then apply the material? What are some of the remaining questions? Uh, and, and really, so yeah, the, the traditional knowledge dissemination is at home. And applying, debating, the more critical skills, the more higher level didactical skill, skills, that's what we do with them in the classroom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds as a real good contribution to uh, Yeah, and you to have to explain it well to the students because students initially thought in the first years, oh, well, why do we get videos? And in the beginning, people were maybe a little bit not suspicious, but they had, of course, they had questions. But once yeah. you explain, like, we do this because when you're in the classroom, we want to be able to discuss with you, to apply it, to see where the tensions are. And that's why we give you the, the other material at home. You can do it yourself. You don't really need us for that to repeat it here. But then we can really use our ink our pre precious in-class time to do that. And if yeah. you explain it well, students are very supportive of it. If you don't explain it, you think you can use videos to replace any part of your lectures or your teaching, um, then it wouldn't work. Okay, thank yeah. you, Janine. Um, Edwin, um, Janine mentioned the classroom um, and what you do in the classroom. What is the effect of using the MOOC in your classroom? Does it change the dynamics? Yeah, because I think the, the, what should be the most interesting part is, of course, uh, knowledge, uh, is, is, well, explaining mm. literature, etc. It's very interesting, but students mostly like it a lot less than engaging with the material, as also Shanine has said. Um, and what, I th what this MOOC, it, ha it helps the, the teacher and the student because it has to be perfect. So the, the things you say have to be crystal clear. So I think that the the classical lectures, the MOOCs are of higher quality than if you would just go and stand in front of class. Yeah. They can repeat it. If they don't understand, they can go back. It's more condensed. So a video of 45 minutes, I dare say it's two and a half hours in class. And if they arrive a little bit late uh, and, 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 and uh, you send them off for, for, for a break and they come back later, I think 45 minutes video is three hours in class yeah. Yeah. and it's far more efficient and it's it's crystal clear because we can't afford mistakes because everyone has to understand what you really mean so for us it was yeah the quality of teaching went up um, being aware that, that you will really have to focus have to be very precise so also you, as you also mentioned that the didactical skills i've been teaching quite a while but but i learned a lot it was yeah, I'm not born again teacher is a bit of a, <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and a passion also for your field of study. Um, yeah. You have to make a selection. What do you present and what not? So I think that the quality is much higher. But of course we got into a discussion. Mm -hmm. If I use the videos, 45 minutes, does that count as three hours? 
Or just one uh, teaching hour. No, but these kind of things. It because yeah, it's sure. a game changer, and that yeah. well, yeah, and that's uh, that's and then it's on your plate, and 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 I think you do uh, very well to to rethink these traditional concepts and standards that we have. Like, how do you deal with that? So it, it's it's. I think our teaching became a lot better. Um, uh, the great the greatest thing is of teaching is working together with students, and now we have far more time to uh, to do so. And we have to, well, that's the other kind of blending. We have to blend it into regular teaching with all the norms and criteria. Well, that's unfortunately uh, uh, on your <laughs> plates. Um, but it is, it, it, it really changes yeah. on many yeah. in many different ways. Maybe, can I add one element? Yeah, of okay. Like for instance, the discussion forum that we also had at the MOOCs, you have an online discussion forum. Yeah. Well, I heard we have some people yeah. from Colombia, Egypt, so great to, to have everyone also in this live stream. Uh, but it offers so many different perspectives for our students here in Leiden mm -hmm. as well. Of course, we already have an international classroom, but in the MOOC we had, I think, 200,000 people in total over the last years from 80 countries. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really brings in very different perspectives for our students here as well. And, and we also ask them, okay, do not only talk to your fellow students here, but also look what's going on online and what you can learn from people who share all these experiences. So I think you can also bring in more, uh, and not only students abroad, but we also have a lot of practitioners, people with a lot of experience in the field who share their knowledge. And our students here at Leine can then also learn from those experiences. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, out of curiosity, a uh, question for both of you. How does this experience of creating a MOOC prepare you for the challenges of higher education during the pandemic? Yeah, I s we sat back and relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> we were relaxed. Yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we had to develop a new course. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we were doing that together. And, and then we built a studio at my place uh, at home. And, and we had a good camera. And, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, it was, well, actually, finally, we could prepare a, a course like we normally do. That's with, yeah. you know, the MOOC standard and the flip the classroom. So, um, um, yeah, for us, it was, well, uh, Feistin already mentioned it, uh, some, had already some experience. But, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah for us, it was quite natural. And, and actually, we, due to the COVID crisis, we, we developed uh, new skills, yeah. new methods, new teaching methods, also new ways of, of testing students whether they know something uh, or not and, and we're still now what we fortunately can go back to uh, physical education or blended education we still use that yeah. mm -hmm. so it was something that not really worried us but it yeah. Yeah, gave us also the opportunity to develop some new skills and techniques yeah, yeah. yeah and again uh, with this forum so we also ask students now from uh, our own master's program yeah to also have their own discussion forum on Brightspace within the Leiden University environment and then let them record weekly videos for us. So I initially we actually started to record our weekly kind of office chats where we discussed the latest, ni latest news and what they were doing on the forum. But then Edwin came up with a great idea like why are we doing it? Why can we not ask students to be more actively participating? Um, so the second course that we were teaching we then asked students okay rather than us presenting what you were doing on the forum maybe you can form an editorial board of students uh, just volunteers, like unpaid, they did it for fun and because it was a good experience for them. We asked four, four or five people to have these weekly short videos that they would share with the class. So we brought in kind of these things that we saw work very well with the MOOC, also now in the education here. And then we later discovered we uh, discovered because yeah. we invited them for drinks for, for ah. helping us and then two of them actually were from the alumni group. from the yeah. MOOC. <laughs> so we, we didn't know that from Malaysia and from India. Yeah. Uh, and, and they were already a bit used to this, this formula and, and we, we, did it, we involved students during, in this MOOC on a sensitive topic and we never run into trouble, yeah. not really, yeah. not once. And, and that gave us also trust yeah. in, in that community mm -hmm. of students. We had moderators, also volunteers back yeah. then. They did a marvelous job. So we felt more confident that we could, you know, give it to well, if we can give it to students worldwide, we can give yeah. it to our own students. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was uh, something that, that, that develops, you know, from the MOOC into regular teaching, then Coursera, of, uh, sorry, Corona, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, yeah. taught us new things. Uh, so I think, yeah, yeah. And, and what we very much like to do is that to share that with our colleagues, uh, yeah. these tips yeah. and tricks. And others that's came up with other uh, tips and tricks. Um. And that, that is really pushing yeah. the boundary yeah. because when you, you always have front runners, so they are yeah. front runners. 
A lot of people think we, we are not able to achieve it, uh, and, and usually they can because yeah. they have to make a copy and, and they can learn from each other at a little bit lower level. And, and ac actually students are asking for that. So when is this possible where Edwin and, 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 and Janine, why isn't it possible in your course? So yeah. th there is always this, yeah. this, I think it's a positive pressure. Uh, yeah. and then, then you really have to explain why you're not doing it, or you have to explain why you do it differently. And, and <coughs> once and now, that, that could be a good idea to have alternatives. Uh, so it, it, it gives some pressure in a positive way, I would say, to our yeah. lecturers. Yeah, definitely yeah. a positive way. Yeah. Um, for a moment, I'm going to turn now to the people uh, following this live stream. Um, my moderators have pulled some interesting questions from the crowd. Um, <laughs> I have one question from uh, Vincent, and he asks, why are universities generally so r reticent to convert MOOCs into credit weight for a formal degree? Does anyone... As an ID, Kun? We were talking up till now about online teaching, which is totally different from online testing, and that's that's why the connection should be brilliant. So there is a huge problem in having online teaching from people you don't know. You have to check them. Uh, are they saying that who they are? Yeah. Uh, should we use proctoring? all kinds of privacy issues and also there's a, a huge bridge between online teaching and the testing out there. Should we do it once a test or should we have continued assessment which is usually not part of the MOOC. So uh, I wouldn't say we are not willing to but that, that is one of those issues which makes it a lot of difficult. Good point, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, I have um, another question, anonymous question. What kind of research is being done with the data in the MOOC uh, terrorism? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's an honest answer. No, well, we tried because we had so many people from around the globe. So we do, uh, and, and initially we did uh, ask uh, students about their experience. And, and um, of course, it's from a scientific point, it's, it's difficult because you, you don't know who's exactly there. So we asked a little bit about background and experiences. Uh, but it's, it's, it's difficult uh, because you, you don't really know the source. Um, but we. We do ask, and th there are some questionnaires that give us a bit of an idea, but, but it's very difficult for research. So we do ask uh, student things, also sometimes to share with each other. Uh, so what is your opinion, those kind of things. But for research, it's, it's more, uh, more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this talk show is not only about uh, MOOCs at La the university, but specifically also about the relaunch of uh, the MOOC uh, on terrorism and counterterrorism. Relaunching after nine, nine years, uh, Edwin, of course you started <laughs> in 2013. Yeah. First tell me why terrorism students are still relevant today. <laughs> well, unfortunately, um, it's still making headlines. Fortunately, also uh, less so than, than when we uh, initially started the course. Actually, we started it in, in I think, 2012, 13. And then we, after that, we had this wave of IS in Islamic State, 2014. So then we had to update it and add another chapter on foreign fighters. Today, one can see that there's other issues, of course, uh, COVID crisis, uh, Afghanistan, Ukraine, environment. Um, and I think, it, it, so it received uh, somewhat less attention, but maybe for our parts of our part of the world, but in other parts of the world, Nigeria, Somalia, it, it doesn't even make headlines today if, if, if 100 people get killed in Somalia. And, and, but it's still out there. And we, well, we offer this course for a worldwide audience. So it's unfortunately still relevant in many parts of the world. Less so in Europe, so uh, knock on wood. Let's hope it stays that way. Uh, but you see, and, it, it can, and things can happen. Uh, well, look at uh, what's happening in Israel and Palestine uh, today. Uh, it, it's, it never stops. Um, uh, so yeah, unfortunately, it's still relevant. Yeah. We also have a model on like more impact management, right? So how you deal with it. And there's also a risk of, especially in, in the Western world, less so than in other parts, like overreacting to terrorism. Um, so it's not necessarily that the score is only relevant is th if the terrorist threat is uh, very high, but also, especially in, in our countries here, like how do we make sure we don't overreact? How can we um, stimulate resilience and self-efficacy of people? So we also want to have a more nuanced, uh, rather than very alarmist, but uh, we also we can deal with it. Many societies have a lot of capacities and people have capacity to deal with it. So we also really want to share that part uh, of the story. Yeah, clear. And maybe a, a promotional question. Why would I <laughs> want to take this course? 
Well, after this course, <laughs> you really ha I hope you have a different uh, view on, on, on the topic. Uh, look at it from a more broader perspective, a worldwide perspective, um, and look at also the limitations of social science. So this course is as much about terrorism as it is about how do we research this complex security uh, issue. So it's, it's, I think, very, we take a very critical stand towards research, social science, uh, social science in the Western world. Um, and at the same time, we pro provide you with um, uh, the, the latest insights in the, in the body of literature and also what's happening around the world. But it's, it's yeah, I think it, it, it teaches you many different, uh, def different things. It's not about the phenomenon. Uh, it's about theory and practice. And it's about, well, the difficulties of researching many social issues, very complex issues, uh, and also very sensitive issues like terrorism. Yeah, okay, thank you, Edwin. Janine, you were involved in, uh, with the first version of this course uh, and several other successful MOOC courses. But now you are uh, one of the leading instructors um, of this, uh, this MOOC. How is that, how's that for you? Well, very exciting. I mean, yeah, as you said, I've been working uh, also at the Center for Innovation for a year as a more project manager of MOOC. So I'm very glad I could uh, assist Edwin also in 2013 already with making this MOOC. Um, yeah, but it's really nice to see, okay, and now that I've also done my own research, that I can also share a bit more of, of my view on things. Uh, but also in the first round, I could al already bring in, I think, a lot of, uh, it was very open also for, for different perspectives. Um, yeah, but it's very exciting for me to not only be behind the camera, but now in front of it. It's also a little bit scary. I mean, it's, it's easier to say, hey, Edwin, you're mispronouncing this, or maybe you should make this more clear. But now you have to stand there and make sure you uh, say it clearly and you really uh, do it well. So uh, it also uh, even makes me appreciate more <laughs> how Edwin has been doing it in the, in the first round. But it's, you know, I'm very excited to, to now also be part of it as an instructor. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's look at some material uh, from the course. We noticed that the field of terrorism studies is dominated by Western-based institutes and scholars and that this has also resulted in a Western-focused research agenda. It's high time to do something about this. There is um, some bias, but then I'd like to um, respond uh, in a way that sort of expands the scope of what we're looking at. When we look at the portrayal of the media of certain violent extremist attacks or incidents in some African countries compared to those attacks that occur in the West, uh, we see a certain, you know, what appears to be sort of different standards being applied in terms of how these events are covered. Well, that was very interesting. Good to hear that your course is dealing with this uh, issue of diversity. It is such a wide, multifaceted issue, isn't it? Uh, how do you think that diversity in the field of terrorism studies will need to grow in the coming five years to overcome this Western bias? Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question, but uh, yeah, a very difficult question. Uh, and that's why we also try to bring in these expert interviews, so additional material uh, of which you just saw a clip. Yes, yeah, so we know that the field is um, yeah, dominated by Western scholars, Western institutes, so that's something that is there. Um, I mean, we, we cannot change that directly, unfortunately. But the first step is to be aware of it, I think, and to make sure, hey, we see it, that there is this dominance of Western-based institutes. Um, but we come up with some suggestions also later in the last week of the course when we speak about like our future research agenda in, uh, in terrorism studies to see, okay, how can we do more joint research projects um, with people in other countries to share expertise both ways? Um, how can we maybe increase funding for projects that not only, or that's a question for the funders, of course, but that do not only focus on the small uh, size phenomenon of terrorism in the Netherlands, fortunately, but also in other countries. So there's many different ways. And I think well, the first step is to be aware uh, and also look at how can you bring in different perspectives into your course. But yeah, it is a reality. So I, I don't think you, you can change that overnight. Um, but we do see, I think it's changing, right? Maybe Edwin, you can say a little well, bit about that. Have you seen a lot of improvements over the last years? Yes, or? we've seen improvements. And Dr. Ologio, who just saw, is, is an example yeah. of that. Uh, by the way, uh, ISS Africa, there's a long uh, collaboration between also institutes here in The Hague, also Klingenaal Institute, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, that, that support that. Dr. Ologio was actually once also a yeah. guest researcher here. So, so we see examples uh, of that and, and we hope the MOOC, or we can provide a platform with that MOOC to, to 
provide positive examples, examples of, of people who, who make that difference, uh, because they are there, but it's more difficult to find them. And well, this, this MOOC is also a great way, so we have a lot of interviews with, with experts, either scholars or practitioners, that we add to the course to, yeah, to be able to update and see how, how for instance, this uh, problem um, well, develops in, in a way I hope <laughs> is, is, uh, is, is, is not solved, but well, we're getting better at it. Um, so these kind of videos, as you just saw, is, is a way. Right? The, the MOOC provides also that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. I think it, it's reflecting the changes in the, in the past decade, and it's a real good contribution uh, to it. Um, Janine, what, what challenges has you have you faced as a young researcher in, in such a field as terrorism studies? Me in particular, uh, on a personal level, yeah. you mean? Um, well, I've, I've mostly uh, faced opportunities more than challenges, so I like to approach it more uh, positively, I think. But yeah, also uh, in terms of gender, I mean, it is still also quite a male-dominated field, although that's also in, uh, changing quite a bit. And especially, I think if we look at our university, especially our faculty and our institute, um, Institute of Security Global Affairs, if I look yeah. around in the hallway, well, I, I think we probably have more women than men. I wouldn't even be sure. Um, so we I even have more women professors than male press at this faculty, Great. which we are proud of. Yeah. <laughs> which we are proud of. <laughs> yes. No, so in yeah. that sense, I haven't yeah. faced those. Fortunately, uh, I'm in a lucky position because I think it's different for, for people in, in other places. Um, but I think our environment here in Institute is a really good example of where it's, it's really uh, balanced and people really value each other on what they can bring and not only are you man or woman or, you know, what have you in a different category and so on. So really, yeah, what can you bring in? Uh, but internationally, when I go abroad in conferences, sometimes it's a bit different. In, in some parts of the world, um, people sometimes still think I'm there to bring the coffee uh, rather than giving the keynote presentation. That still happens also based on age, maybe more than gender sometimes. Yeah. Um, so that, that's something you have to deal with. Also with my name, uh, De Roy. So usually uh, foreign people think my first name is Roy and I'm a man. And then they say, <laughs> are you Roy? Oh, 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 we expected that. Uh, a white old man to be here and then they see me. So sometimes you have these nice surprise effects, but overall my work here and at this university, especially here at uh, this faculty and institute, I, I fortunately don't really face those uh, challenges, I think. Great to hear. Yeah. Is that also a, a deliberate strategy, Kuhn, of FGGA? Partly, uh, but I think the main, main thing here is that we are a rather young faculty, uh, growing rather fastly. Uh, and that's why we can hire the superb staff. But when you're growing every year, you can just hire the best people around in an international environment. I think that's the main issue. And of course, there is this policy, not, no, not only at FGG, also in the university, to just look at, at a, a wide, a wide horizon on, on hiring people. It's not only about knowledge. It has to do with uh, assimilation. It has to do with gender. It has to do with uh, different opinions and uh, skills, background, everything. And that is, I would say, on the agenda for a couple of years. And because we are young and, and we are growing, we are having the ability to, to hire those, those, those uh, things. Um, I think that that will be the answer. Yeah, yeah. thank you very yeah. much. Um, Hester, diversity and inclusion is, of course, one of the important themes of uh, Leiden University's yes. strategic plan. How are young academics going to be supported uh, by Leiden University to deal with these challenges? Yes, yeah, I think um, uh, diversity and inclusion is crucial for our academic community to thrive. Uh, we have realized this already a while ago and have it uh, specifically on the agenda. And also in our current strategy, of course, it's, it is key. I'm really happy to see that it's also explicitly addressed the different perspectives uh, in the MOOC, uh, terrorism and counterterrorism. And there you see that technology helps because you can even give the different perspectives and backgrounds a voice and, 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 and have people included in your, in your MOOC. So I think that's a great example. Also happy to hear uh, how, uh, how uh, it is on the agenda in the Institute of Security and Global Affairs and here at the Faculty uh, uh, of Governance and Global Affairs. Uh, I think how we support it is to still put it on the agenda, have conversations with really with the institutes, our educational programs, conversations about the perspectives you include. Uh, we have some supporting structures uh, like a center of expertise uh, on diversity and inclusion. Uh, our young academy is, is helping us. Uh, that in teachers academy is also good to include many different uh, people. 
uh, also young people give them a voice here and we're continuously improving and this takes time and I think we're definitely on the way uh, and uh, well it will, will, will remain on the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn again to our audience. Um, there's still some questions that my moderators uh, are sending me. Mm -hmm. A question for uh, Edwin and Janine. Uh, will you consider making another MOOC, a masterclass or a specialization maybe on terrorism uh, for those that want to go deeper into the subject? <laughs> well, that would be, I, I would, yeah, it would be a great plan for the future. I think that we're very happy that we launched this MOOC because it's, it is a very intensive project and it takes a lot of time to, to prepare it. Um, but yes, definitely, I, I think there's still room to go deeper. So yeah, if, if there would be uh, resources, opportunities available, I'm also looking yeah, around no. the table here. We will find uh, we can okay, find can money you money sign too. in? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, but money. yeah, if there's support, uh, you get time for this. And that's maybe still a little bit of a, little bit of a challenge from for university, that it's still not seen as regular education. There's that's still uh, quite often a debate to be, um, that we need to have at university. Um, that some people still think, oh, MOOCs, you know, oh, that's such nice innovative thing, but is that really the core business? But we, we really think it is. So, um, yeah, I think in that sense, some steps can still be taken uh, that will make it possible for, for people like us uh, yeah, to, to go even one step ahead or, or, or I don't know, produce another MOOC. Uh, yeah. I'd rather see if, if you're really interested in, in a deeper knowledge in the, this field, come to Leiden. <laughs> And yeah, many do, yeah. and many do. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is, a, a, and I'm serious, I mean, that's a, a great opportunity. Uh, the other thing that uh, we tried to do in the past, but there's so little time and so many great ideas, was actually meetups, uh, yeah. maybe then workshops or summer, uh, yeah. a, a summer school or something like that. I think that might be yeah. very interesting, especially to uh, professionals in the field. We have a center for professional learning here at uh, Leiden University. Um, a mix with yeah. um, um, uh, these kind of courses, so you, so everybody's on the same uh, same level, having followed the MOOC, and then, well, depending on the demand, we could focus on a certain topic uh, with professionals, with students uh, through a summer school, for instance, and then maybe also with yeah. some additional videos, etc. I'd rather see that. Um, I think yeah. that's more fruitful because, in the end. We want to meet each other, we want to yeah. learn from each other. And um, so that will be my, uh, rather be my next investment. Yeah. So either you come to us or we organize yeah. something uh, smaller, summer course or something like yeah. that. That would be really interesting. And I think that also solves uh, some yeah. of the issues you just raised about, for instance, that the difficulty of testing, right? Which is hard online, but if you say what you say you do, yeah an online course for professionals, really in-depth, and then you come uh, in, in the summer period, you spend one or two weeks here at Leiden University, and then you write yeah, a paper and an exam. So I think that's a mix. So I, yeah, I think that's actually... And we can uh, make use of the classes that you develop. Huh? They yeah. are empty during yeah. the summer yeah. break. Anyway. No, but seriously, th there are opportunities yeah. there. That will be, uh, so that's yeah. a good suggestion. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, a more uh, detailed question. Is, is criminal terrorism and associated violence a thing? Is it interesting to address in the course at some point? Or is that something for other researchers? Well, I, I have uh, 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 also work at the police academy. Um, uh, I think organized crime is, of course, and, and, and unfortunately in many countries, uh, very violent, uh, very destructive, but also in the Netherlands, uh, causing a lot of harm to society. Uh, but I'd, I'd rather not label that a terrorism. It's a, it's a distinct uh, phenomenon. Uh, although it worries people, uh, of course, the killing of well, a Dutch uh, journalist, of public prosecutors, uh, lawyers, uh, threatening politicians, uh, sometimes by criminal organizations, is a bit into the twilight zone between terrorism and organized crime. I would love to develop a MOOC on, on or contribute to develop a MOOC on that uh, topic, but we have to be very careful um, uh, what is terrorism and what not. In our course, well, we spend actually a whole week uh, about the definition issue. One has to be very careful. Um, but as the Institute of Security and Global Affairs, and you mentioned already a number of other MOOCs on, on risks, uh, on other issues, I think it fits in, let's say, a collection of, of MOOCs on security issues, but I would make it a separate one. Great, thank you, Edwin. Uh, final question. How can MOOCs in general, and this MOOC in particular, play a role in reducing culture shock between societies? 
Well, that's a big question, right? So yeah. I think of that reminds me of the Huntington Clash of Civilization, kind of. So I wouldn't be sure if you, a, a culture shock, but, but well, to this idea of diversity and uniting different perspectives, I think that is really something uh, we do and we really stress. And I think that's something we well, paid a lot of attention to. And it's also the model of like the university, like Bastion of Freedom. Um, so how can you share these different perspectives that might sometimes clash? But if you're very open about it and you acknowledge that these differences exist, but we try as academics to show them in an objective manner. So I think we really try not to take our position in, in certain debates, but just show there's a diversity. Um, then people accept that diversity often very well and they respect each other's point of view and will listen from each other. But I think as teachers, you really have to create that environment where people feel they can share their um, different perspectives but also really force them to it's okay if someone else has a very different opinion it doesn't mean you have to fight with someone or someone has to not tell their opinion because it might offend you or it might make you feel uncomfortable that's also how people learn so be open to sometimes feel uncomfortable feeling uncomfortable of things be open about that yeah. but yeah so accept that diversity see it as a strength rather than as something that is scary or that might threaten you uh, and I think we really try to do it in the MOOC, also in our education here at That's Leiden. That's the opening line mostly in, in class, so we, uh, we want to hear your opinion. We always use Bastion of yes. Freedom, we're very yeah. proud of yeah. that. Yeah. And we're also very proud of, of, of diversity, diversity not as a goal but as a tool. So we always ask like, where you're from, yeah. what's your educational uh, background, do you have uh, uh, experience in the working, uh, have you worked in the field? So we always ask these questions. and, and and, and challenge students to, to share that with each yeah. other. Yeah, and, and it, it works yeah, in a yeah. wonderful way. So we also get a lot from our yeah. uh, students um, by providing actually this, this free and, uh, space, this space for debate. And, and actually, well, this is a very sensitive topic and sometimes yeah, I'm afraid yeah. that... <laughs> compared to all other kinds of educations like lecturing. Uh, so, so there's actually no exclusion is it? there's only inclusion because yeah. the marginal cost of participating in a MOOC is, 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 is zero or hardly any compared to all kind of other education where you immediately exclude people because there's no yeah. space in the room or whatever so so that the, the form itself is, is rather I would say inclusive compared to all other forms yeah. you have people around the world mm. in other other forms of education you don't have that no. so it's the choice of Leiden to go for Coursera and uh, future learn and to make it Accessible to everyone, yeah. I think, is a yeah. very good one. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. yeah. we don't only want yeah. 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 So we really focus like not only the European and American uh, students. We really like that. I mean, we're also based here, but we really uh, we're also very happy that we saw people from all over the world, right? 80 countries. So what we also heard people who now are in this live stream. It's very important, uh, and not only have the, the Germans and the Belgians, which are great and we love them, but really to have a more global perspective in our course. Yeah. It's really awesome. Um, we're getting to the ending uh, of this uh, this live stream and a uh, talk show and uh, I have to say it was really inspiring talking to you. We talked today uh, about MOOCs in the last decade at Leiden University and uh, the lessons learned for campus education. Together with the lessons uh, from the pandemic in the next five years, Leiden University will explore a happy medium between online and face-to-face -face mm -hmm. campus education. Blended learning, the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> All of this to celebrate the relaunch of the classic online learning course, the MOOC Terrorism and Counterterrorism, which goes live on Monday, the 25th of April. Well, a big thank you to our guest, Hester Bell, Rector Magnificus. Great to have you here today. Uh, Kun Kaminada, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. Thank you for having time for this uh, live stream. And of course, Edwin and Janine, um, the instructors of this newly relaunched MOOC on terrorism and counterterrorism. Um, check out uh, the link uh, here at YouTube to find the course on both platforms, uh, Coursera and FutureLearn. And of course, also a big thank you to the team of Center of Innovation who hosted this uh, show. And we hope uh, that you have enjoyed watching this and we will see you in the MOOC. Thank you, goodbye. Hi there. Terrorism has been among the defining features of our time often making headlines worldwide and threatening peace and security and relations between communities. Well, if you want to know more about terrorism and counterterrorism, then we are looking forward to working with you to understand and analyze these issues. My name is Janine de Roy van Zijderwijn.
And together with my colleague, we will investigate these phenomena. Who is threatened? How? By whom? And why? And how can we limit the impact of terrorism? What trends and developments do we see today? Well, these are just a handful of questions that we will explore in this course. My name is Edwin Bakker. How are we going to do this? Well, first we look into the essence and definition of terrorism. We discuss the state of the art of terrorism and counterterrorism studies. And we explore 10 assumptions that academia and think tanks have come up with. Finally, we discuss how we can deal with terrorism and its impact on our daily lives. We end with analyzing how terrorism changes over time, what we can expect in the years to come, and finally, we discuss a possible future research agenda. If you're interested in knowing more about these kind of questions and topics, and if you want to learn from the experience and knowledge of an audience of students and practitioners from all over the world, well then, you're very welcome to join us in this course, Terrorism and Counterterrorism, Comparing Theory and Practice. We hope to see you soon.